Good afternoon, I'm Simon Sporter and welcome to our latest in a series of Q&As. Today we've got Hugh Phillips with us. Hugh is a ten tennis racket technician. Welcome, Hugh. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That's a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. He knows almost everything there is to know about our rackets and the technology behind them and how to help choosing you choosing a racket, but also has a really good knowledge on choosing tennis shoes, choosing the correct strings to go into your rackets and how often you should change your strings, for example. And he also, in fact, has a good knowledge on our tennis balls and how tennis balls could actually have an impact upon your game of tennis. And in fact, with the professionals, how in effect tournament to tournament, they vary all of the time and then that can have an impact upon how they play their game. So Hugh, if you would just tell us a bit about your background to start with, and then yep. we can sort of take it from there. Thank you, Hugh. Yeah, no problem. Um, I'll try and keep this relatively brief about my background. Um, so uh, I've worked in tennis for quite a long time, uh, played it since the age of six, uh, played up to about county level, but nothing much better than that. Um, but started stringing rackets uh, at the age of 18, uh, mainly because it was costing my parents a fortune in restrings when I was playing tournaments. So um, they wanted me to uh, to learn, and, uh, and so I did. So they bought me a, a, a relatively cheap machine at the time, learned how to do it. Uh, when I went, this was about the, at the age of 18, strung racket, learned to do it at strung rackets whilst at university for the rest of the team and so on, just to make a little bit of extra beer money. Um, and then around right about the age of 30, um, decided to take a little bit more seriously. I was also had another another career um, working in uh, procurement at the time. Um, started to take a little bit more seriously with a view to um, developing my knowledge, uh, potentially looking to do tournament stringing and working at uh, large events. Um, fast forward a few years, uh, a few exam stringing exams later. Um, I've been stringing on the tour now since around right about 2014, 2015. <laughs> Um, and I've been part of the Wimbledon team since 2016. Um, I've strung uh, at various different events, string largely the British tour events, um, working with Dunlop prior to that Babalat, mm. um, working at uh, Nottingham, Eastbourne, um, um, at Manchester, such like, and also then Wimbledon. Um, I've also strung uh, at the Davis Cup um, and the Billie Jean King Cup, and last year I was very lucky to... Uh, be able to strip be part of the team stringing at the Labour Cup in London, um, where I sort of achieved a little mini dream of mine to the string for all the big four, uh, actually in in one day, bizarrely. So wait, you wait, like buses, wait for ages for the opportunity, then you string them all in, you know, one after the other. Um, and uh, I was also being a big Federer fan, I was able to, uh, I was given his last ever professional match rackets to string. So that was. Uh, that was there wasn't a dry eye in the house basically in, in the O2 uh, there so um uh, that that was that was quite a privilege and quite a nice uh, thing to do um so yes uh so I also um customize rackets as well as string them so tweak the the settings this match rackets with with uh, lead tape silicon and what have you strong for various um British and, and other professionals on the tour, as well as uh, regular players who just want to get their rackets optimised for their play. Um, one, one client that I that I actually customised for is Emma Raducanu, and I, I built the rackets uh, that she then went on to win the US Open with, um, customised those for her. So, um, so I now largely work very heavily in tennis. I Even though I have my own business, I also work for Tennis Point, um, working as one of their partnership managers working with the the LTA um and I've been doing that for just over a year as well alongside my my uh, my own business so it's fairly safe to say that I'm very entrenched in all things tennis so right thank you Hugh so who would like to go first and ask a question I've got plenty but I'd much prefer you all ask your questions Um, am I on mute? Oh, I can hear no. someone speaking, so with pleasure, just introduce yourself and away you go. Hi, this is Andrew. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what's the highest and lowest, uh, sort of techie question, highest and lowest tensions on the tour? That's a very, very good question. Um, 
so I've actually I've actually been lucky enough to string or unlucky enough, depending which way you look at it, string both ends of the spectrum. The highest uh, is eighty eight pounds um, with twenty percent pre stretch, which essentially makes it close to one hundred pounds of tension in the racket. And I think the lowest uh, is around about three. I think it was about twenty pounds. That was Manorino. He sort of fluctuates yeah. up and down. Um, and the 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 person who actually has the the highest tension um, is actually one of the ladies, uh, Eckery, who likes to have a racket to very very tight. So okay. those are quite those are quite interesting to string. Yeah, and um, sorry if I can jump in there again. Um, I, I'm a tennis coach. I've also done some stringing in the past. I don't anymore. Um, but often as a coach and, and as a string, I was always asked for recommendations for rackets and uh, strings and hybrids. And um, uh, I, How do you answer them questions? I always struggle with answering them questions. Um, well, there's quite a few different questions there. Yeah. Largely what you would what you would look to is, is the playing style of the player, um, how often they're playing um what sort of game they play do they hit with spin do they hit with slice do they hit it flat um what level do they play at to, to be honest as well because um certain players will benefit from having polyester strings to generate more top spin and, and spin on the racket other types of players wouldn't really get that benefit because they don't have the racket head speed so those are the sorts of questions um you know you need to ask it it's 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 really trying to get as much information about their playing style as possible to make an informed decision or okay. guess. Okay. Does that answer your questions, Andrew? Uh, yeah, I suppose. Um, yeah, there's a lot of experience behind when you get them answers as well to to be able to steer them. Do you yes. provide a, a website or a blog or, or anything um, to help along the way? Uh, well, I do. I do have. Uh, I do have my own website, which which does have some of that information. But as you can probably appreciate that there's, yeah, there's quite a lot of variables there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, yourself, uh, if you know, as a coach, you know, you're, you're also best place to sort of see what their play is like as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, in in a session with them. So, um, you know, sometimes it's very obvious. Sometimes it's very clear they're using the wrong racket for their game or, or the wrong strings for argument's sake other times it's is advising them to to look at two or three different rackets in a range to to see which that you think would suit them and then they 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 then find their preference out of demoing those frames that that was always the approach uh that i've taken um is sort of like go and get two or three demos if you can you know i've got some yeah. as well and then ultimately i always um went on the view of okay what do you what do you like the most and even if that wasn't what i thought they should have i'd sort of go along with it to so that they get the feel yeah yeah and and it, yes i don't disagree with that and and it, you know that that on the on the on the main part would work it depends again it depends what they're looking to get out if they're looking to just play once a week in that situation they're probably be fine if they're looking to develop their technique and then you've also got to bear that in mind that the racket they'd like instantly because they're just blocking their forehand back might yeah. not suit them in six months time where they're hitting Rafael Nadal topspin forehands sort of thing yeah, yeah. you know so um you know you try to advise them so they don't end up wasting their money either you know Okay, lovely. Thank you. No okay, anybody else? Hugh, I've got a question. It's a Douglas Mower. Um, it's a, it's a it's a simple one. It might just be helpful if you were able to describe. You know, if you have a a, a, a tighter string, what mm -hmm. does that what does that do? In other words, what are some simple rules around what you would um, what you would uh, expect to to do um, in terms of restringing a racket? So, firstly, the, the general rule of thumb for restringing a racket, it, it, with regards to the frequency of getting your racket restrung, is if you play three times a week, you should look, look to get your racket strung three times a year, regardless of if it's snapped or broken. Um, because strings essentially are all about their elasticity, and the more they're used, um, 
the more the elasticity drops off from the tent you know we, we interpret that as tension dropping off but also their playability is dropping off at the same time so you know i i often get uh clients come up to me and they've had the same rackets in their uh, same strings in their racket for two or three years and they swear by it because it hasn't snapped but you know there's no there's no life left in the strings and large by and large a lot of those players they've got tennis elbow straps on you know once the elasticity gone, the shock absorption of the string has gone as well. And that's only then going to go one way and that's being transmitted into the arm. So it's much better to have fresher strings. To go back to your point about whether to have looser or tighter tension, if, if you have tight tension, you'll get more control. If you think about the string bed as a, as a trampoline, the tighter the strings, the less they will, you know, compress and, and add power to the ball but you'll get more control the the lower the tension the more they will snap back the more power that will be generated with at the expense of some control what i always generally try to advise people though is to go as low as th they can actually control the ball so drop the tension in their rackets there'll be a, a you know law diminishing returns at some point where you can't keep the ball in dial it back up because the, the looser the tension, the more the more the racket is helping you is doing the work on the ball. So the tighter the tension, the more control you have, but the less, the harder you're going to have to work to generate pace on the ball. Makes okay, sense. Thank you. Um, just to, just a, a word, Andrew. We keep flicking to your screen, so I'm going to put you on mute. Just unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Thank you, Douglas. Lovely. Good idea. Okay, Douglas, does that answer your question? Or... It does. No, thank, thank you, Hugh. No problem. Okay. Uh, so, Hugh, one, one of the things that we've talked about previously is the different weight of rackets. And I've always mm -hmm. found, and whether I have, I have, for example, three identical rackets, but mm -hmm. they all play slightly differently. Whether that's yeah. because I ha I've obviously had them strung at slightly different times, or mm -hmm. whether it's because of the weighting, I... Uh, we chatted about how there is a error rating on rackets that they can vary quite a bit weight wise. So do yep. you think is it the strings and the times that I've had them strung or is it and therefore that they're nearer being worn out and their usage or yep. is it the grip or is it in effect the weight? What's making the difference with my rackets? Uh, it could be all three of those, um, to be perfectly honest. Um... To, to address your earlier point about having three rackets the same, you only purchase them from a shop. You think you'll get buying the same frames. They look the same. They're called the same, same grip size and so on. And they are by and large the same, but all the manufacturers have a manufacturing tolerance. And um, generally that's about plus or minus seven grams. So if you're buying a racket that's 300 grams in weight, for argument's sake, in a very extreme scenario, worst case, you can have one racket being 293, one racket being the 300, and the other racket being 307. So you'd have two of those rackets being nearly 20 grams apart in weight, which if you look at a lot of the manufacturer's range, you know, head, bubble up, that's, that's almost, you know, if you look at the head gravity, well, that's the difference in weight between the mid plus and the, the S model, you know, two different models. Whereas, whereas you bought three thinking they're the same, and I, I stress it's in an extreme, you know, very, you'd be very unlucky to get three rackets for those, those tolerances, but it could happen. So what I do for a lot of players is I take away that, that tolerance. So you customize, you match them and you make them all identical. So then to go on to the next point, you know, that the frames are actually identical. And then if there's any differences after that, it could be down to, you know, uh, st strings in a certain racket being older than, one of the other rackets, I would always recommend cost allowing getting all, if you're getting three rackets around, get them all strung at the same time and then rotate them round when you play. So don't what a lot of players generally do, they'll get three rackets done and, and, and lower level tour players are, and then they'll use one until it's dead, until it snaps and then they'll go and get another one. But what you'll find if you're in the middle of a match, you'll suddenly find that that second racket plays completely differently because it's the strings are a lot fresher even though they may have been sat there for months it it just doesn't feel the same as if you rotate them around so you play one one weekend you use one the next weekend you use the next 
and you rotate them round, the strings in theory will wear out much more evenly and then you don't have that variance when you come to use them. Okay, and the grips, the only other grip. area I thought considered, there could be differences when you put a new grip on, it's newer yep. than the old grip, and that could then have a further impact. Again, if you're if you're rotating the rackets round, and you, and you come to decide you want to replace the, the grip that came with the racket, replace all the rackets at the same time, because what especially with the softer grips that you get on most rackets these days, not many rackets come with leather grips anymore, but it even applies to leather. After how, you know, if you're after use, basically that that sponginess will eventually compress like anything, just like you say for at home, it is never as cushioned as it once was. Um, it'll eventually compress. What that is doing is it's getting it's getting thinner because that sponge, you know, that 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 uh, sponginess, I suppose, has compressed and has gone. So if you then you then find if you put a new one on, it'll be much. It'll feel much bigger. It's the same grip that you had in, initially, but it's just new. So if you try and rotate the rackets around, they'll all wear down roughly the same. And then when you replace them, they'll all feel the same again. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody else have a question? Hi, yeah. Hugh. Hi, Vian. Oh, yeah, go on, Hi. Clive. <clears throat> um, what would you recommend? You mentioned about um, someone paying three times a week. Yeah. Uh, you change three times a year. What's your views on different surfaces, like going from, say, some are going to indoors. Would you change the tension? Would you change the composition of the strings? Um, potentially, uh, potentially change the tension um, because obviously, if you're going for into indoors, it's generally quicker. So you need a little bit more control. So you might want to go up a couple of pounds over your your regular tension just to bring that control in because the ball's moving quicker. Um, a lot of players on the tour, for argument's sake. When they go through the different swings of the year, the hard courts, the clay courts, the grass. When they go from clay to grass, quite often they'll they'll up their tension for the same reason, just because grass is theoretically <laughs> not so much these days, but theoretically much quicker than the clay. Um, so that you know, and you'll also find what we find at Wimbledon, players will generally get less rackets restrung um, at, 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 in the grass because they'll use them a bit more you know they, they they don't necessarily it's quicker they don't wear out in quite the same way they still get plenty done but in when they're playing on the clay the clay gets into the string it, it's a bit more it's one of a better phrase dirty it gets the strings a little bit wears them out much quicker so they get more rackets done um but yeah for that it still applies for recreational players or you know, that, that you should look to perhaps you know, if you're getting them restrung frequently and if you're playing in tournaments, you should look to get them done even more frequently again. But going indoors, yes, you, you might want to up the tension a little bit just to accommodate the... Um, it it depends what surface the indoor court is as well, because if you go to a David Lloyd and you play on the carpet they have, that's very quick. My local indoor centre has acrylic, which is the same court they have outdoors during the summer. They just put a bubble over it, so technically the surface hasn't changed. But but you you it's experimentation. You might find you 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 benefit from going up a little bit uh, with tension to accommodate the, the the different enclosed conditions. Thank you. Okay, so I think Stephen, you wanted to come in. You're on mute, Stephen. If you want to come off mute. Hi. Um... We obviously, I have a few questions if that's okay. Yeah. Sure Beverly would also. I mean, you are obviously, we're very privileged because you are obviously, I'm not being funny. Um, you're obviously at top of your profession. I would also like to say that although we have the same surname, we're not related. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> I've spelt slightly different. Um, I mean, you're obviously at the, the, the top racket person. Um, can the likes of me, or, or my, members of my club, mm -hmm. um, contact you for racket stringing? Are you available? And how do we contact you if you are? Um, thank you. Uh, yes, yes, I am. Um, I, I string from my home office. Um, I, uh, depending how local people drop rackets off um, to me here, or they send them on mail order. Um, the details of which are on my um, on my website. 
Okay. Is, what what area are you in? I'm in Buckinghamshire in Penn, so near yeah. High Wycombe, near High Wycombe. Stephen, okay. I can sh I can share I can share after this event. I can share Hugh's Thank you very on, much. On who wants okay, because you know this this gentleman is obviously you know is the very best. A um, couple of things I want to ask, and I'll put you on to Bev. Um, the you mentioned about stringing bass, um, and I've heard this for some time. If you play three times a week, you mm -hmm. have your racket strung three times a year. Yeah. Um, how long can the racket sustain being restrung? If that makes sense. Um, it's a very good question. Um. For recreational players, several years. Um, for prof professional players, to to quote an example that I'm aware of, Roger Federer, who we all know, um, he would get a lot, a lot of players. He would get about sixty frames a year from Wilson. Okay. So for for the Australian swing of the season, he'd have a batch of twelve or fifteen. For the clay court season, he'd be given another batch. But you've got to bear in mind every time every match he plays, he'd be getting all twelve rackets restrung. And then when he he played his match, all those and he had another practice, all those rackets would be cut out again and restrung forever. And obviously for someone like him, he was generally mm. in most of the tournaments. So you know that that's a lot of rackets. So every time you restring a racket, the graphite fibers in the frame break down a little bit. Now, for you and I playing on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, not dramatically noticeable, but for a professional player, they will know that after a long period of time, quite famously in, in nerdy circles that I work in. Um, Del Potro had a problem when he was playing. He was using an old version of his Wilson racket for many years after they brought out a new version. And that was because he liked it the way it was, but because it had been really strung so often and he hadn't moved on to the next version, it had basically it had gone softer. So every time Wilson tried to give him a new one, he couldn't he couldn't find the feel that he liked because he was so used to this softened up frame, this battered softened up frame. And he was at one point, I think it was at Wimbledon, one of the grandson, he was down to his last two or three rackets, which is unheard of for players at that that level. Yeah. Um and that was because he just couldn't get the same. Wilson couldn't make the same feel in another frame because it had just been strung so often. So for for the mere mortals, though, you know, that aren't involved in Grand Slams, rackets are built to to um, they're more likely to stretch or walk if someone snapped a string and they leave it in the boot of their car or their or their bag for six months before they get it restrung. That's one little bit of advice I always try to give to players. If your string snaps, when you get home, just cut the rest of the strings out just to relax the frame. Because what a lot of players do is they'll just cut it, the, the string snap, they'll put it back in their bag, forget about it for several weeks. And that can, some, in extreme circumstances, cause the frame to slightly warp, I suppose, you know, because you've still got the other strings under tension, this one that's snapped that's not, but it's all going to centre on the one spot. So... Frames that they, they will last last for years. The, 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 even though the manufacturers bring out new frames every couple of years these days, the frames themselves, as long as the grommets are in good condition, the, the frames will be will be fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, another yeah. question, if I may. Um, mm. go, go if that's okay, Simon, and then I probably sure. wants to ask something. Um. Um, I've always had to buy wide fitting shoes, mm -hmm. uh, which I find in England is very, very difficult. Although I have found a mail order company called Fitville to do a wide fitting shoe. It's right. not the best quality, but it it's more comfortable for me. Um, but are there do you know of any availability of proper wide fitting tennis shoes in, in the UK? Um that there are so K Swiss do some um do wide fitting shoes. Um uh, Adidas have some in their range as well. But I I confess they are limited. Yeah. Um I played with the Defier. Um yeah, very which popular. was wide fit and that wasn't that really isn't wide fitting enough. I have to right. go to a cobbler to get it stretched. Oh, okay. Uh, but it was a good but it was a good quality leather shoe. 
Yeah, but, it's... Uh, but not wide enough. That was the one I was thinking. Adidas yeah. do. It's unfortunately not as prevalent. That they're quite prevalent in the states. Wide yeah. fitting shoes, you get much more options. Mm. Uh, in in Europe and the UK, I don't know if it's something about it's, we're generally smaller. I don't know, but we 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 don't have so many wide fitting shoes. But, um. I mean, what I'd suggest, I mean, I, I work for Tennis Point, as I said earlier, we, we have the, we have a full range of different shoes on there. Um, yeah. And some do have a, a wide fitting option, but it's not mm. many. It's not many. No. It's no. the ones I've... And Hugh, if you were, sorry to interject, Stephen, but if you were, for example, going on to either a Tennis Point website or mm. any other tennis specialist, yes. yeah. obviously there's a specification of shoes, but... Maybe I've never looked for the width of a shoe, particularly it's, with an issue personally. But would you get that kind of detail on a website? Um, if the manufacturer has provided it, if it if it's classed as a wide fitting shoe, because I know Adidas do have some of their range in a wide fitting option, and the same with their golf shoes, they they offer wide fitting versions. Mm. But if I'm honest, it's not consistent. It's not consistent. No. It, and it just because they've done it for six months on one particular model doesn't always mean they're going to do it the next six months on the next model. Um, I think it depends on availability. So it's worth going down the non-automated route of sending an email to the particular specialist and asking the question. Well, this is what, this yes. is what yeah. I, I have done. But I, but if anybody's really stuck and they really need a, they really need a wide fitting shoe, I would recommend they look at this company called Fitfill because it does do a job. It the the quality is not as good as um, K Swiss, but they're reasonably priced and they are tennis shoes. Um, it's a mail order company. I'd like if I may to put you on to the boss, um, and I think. Um, I think you're going to find this question interesting. Okay. Oh my God. <laughs> Hiya. Hello. Hi. Uh, I'm. I play about twice a week, yep. and I've got a head. It says S six liquid metal edition oversized. Okay. Is this one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I must have been playing with it what ten years or so, and I've never ever had it restrung. Okay. And now you're putting like doubts in my mind. I think he. I'm looking at it. Oh, yeah, and right. It's not frayed, and the the black thing, when it gommets or whatever, they look all right. I, I've I never, it's never had a break of string. I mean, do I just le let sleeping dogs lie, or should I get the restrung? You, 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 you will find it staggering the difference if you have it restrung. Beverly, put your racket down now. We've seen your racket. Oh, yeah. We will see you again. Yeah, um, sorry. If if you've had never had it restrung in about ten years, um, it was probably and you're playing twice a week. It was probably past its best about nine and a half years ago. <laughs> um, so I I would recommend right. very heavily that you you get it restrung. Oh, and uh, I don't. Know you know, it gives me the elbow. You've slightly cut out now, Beverly. Unfortunately, can you? You, really? need to speak into the, you need to speak into the microphone, Beverly. Uh, yeah, I was thinking if I have it done, will I regret it? It will be different, and I will blame the strings. It, and... it will feel it will feel much fresher. You're you're not getting anything out of those strings now. They're not they're not doing anything for you other than potentially uh, sending shock into your arm. Uh, particularly with a, a light, uh, quite stiff racket, which that one is. Yeah, uh, power orientated. So I, I would recommend in that frame getting a multi filament, get it restrung really with a multi filament, <laughs> multi -filament. Around, around about 54 55 pounds. You don't hit her. If we, if we, if we come to you, we want our racket strung by you. Mm -hmm. Um, we could probably, we live in Edgeware, so you're probably quite drivable. Okay, uh, yeah. So do, do you? So presumably, many of your customers, do you post the, you dispatch the rackets back, or I can do, yeah, it, it, yeah. Okay. Right. How do you do it? Uh, well, I I get I have racket boxes and things, so I just um, okay. I send it back via every and recorded delivery. Okay, and 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 I'm asking this question for anybody else listening who may want to know what's the turnaround time. 
Uh, my usual turnaround uh, from a seat racket is 48 hours. Okay, well, that's pretty can, good. Can, can be done quicker if, if necessary, um, but yeah. I normally quote 48 hours. Okay, well, that's, that's, that's excellent. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank so, you. Hugh, on the topic, so, for example, say Stephen or anybody else were sending the rackets to you. Typically, mm. I think most people are using uh, a synthetic gut to restring rackets. Is that what you would typically use? For an um, average club player, before to to use that racket that I've just seen in the um in the picture there as an example, yes, I would. Basically, if you're not if you're not a big string breaker, if you're not snapping strings frequently, um, then there's not really a huge need to put a polyester uh, monofilament in in the in the racket. Um, those strings, uh, the likes, you know, that Rafa Nadal and I know that a lot of the pros use are stiffer. But they're designed to generate much more spin, uh, but top spin, but need the racket head speed to generate it. So um, if you're using a, a, and they're also meant, they're not really meant to go in a, an oversized racket like that, because those rackets are quite powerful, quite stiff. You then add in a stiff string. You basically essentially got almost got a paddle bat. Um, you know, it's just stiff and unforgiving. So if you're not necessarily generating lots of racket head speed, you're not generating, uh, you're not snapping strings on a regular basis. I would recommend putting something like, like a nice multi-filament. Examples would be Wilson Sensation, Babala XL, um, because you'll get plenty of feel out of that, um, reasonable durability. And a lot more, you know, uh, a lot more forgiving on the arm, and it and it also had sufficient power to to, you know, to to enjoy the game. Okay, great. Uh, Andrew, you've got a question. If you want to come off mute now, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yep. Andrew. Please carry okay. on. Uh, so, uh, uh, maybe two questions here. One is uh, leading on from the Del Potro. Um, yes. Uh, is there any rumour in the fact that when these guys get a new racket, that it's just painted the new colours, they keep their old <laughs> ones and it, there's just a paint job on them? Can you substantiate that rumour? Or... I, can, I can neither confirm nor deny that rumour. <laughs> but uh, do you have more insight than me? Uh, the short answer to that would be yes. Um Yes, uh, I could probably safely say, without getting hung, drawn and quartered by the various racket brands, um, that what the players endorse isn't necessarily exactly what they use. Okay, yeah, that's fair enough, yeah. Um, that all, all, all professional players will have their frames customised to their own specification. And yes, it has been known that some of the frames are a different frame right than than they, they they actually painted as mentioning no names andy murray well i, I cannot comment on that okay the second one was carry, carry on andrew so the second one was um a, a stringing related question I, I mentioned earlier i don't string but i have in the past and one of my bugbears with other people that strung they'd often uh so sort of do the mains and then leave the racket and then come back and do the crosses. I was always one that I wanted to get it all done in one. What was your view on that? Uh, you did it absolutely correctly. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, it, 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 you shouldn't just do the mains. It's bad practice to do the mains, leave it and come back and do the crosses um, because it's, just, it's bad for the frame. Um, to just leave it sat there with the mains done, because okay, they creep, cool. but the strings will start creeping, and yeah. you'll find it hard to get the racket off the machine to start with. And I, I thanks for that. And I think I've just found your website. Is it Racket Spec? That's it. That's me. Yeah, yeah. It's very good, guys. It's it's very good. <laughs> okay. Thank so you. you on that with the racket stringing, if people are stringing their own own rackets. Mm -hmm. Would you go with one, I'm probably not describing it correctly, would you go with one string for the whole racket or would you go for independent strings for the two? Well, hybrid, <coughs> hybrid. I mean. 
but... it depends depends on player preference uh, and what they want uh, th there's no right or wrong answer to that if um, some players would prefer having a, a full bed is what we call it a full bed of one string um, other players prefer you know for example if you take the professional level Rafa Nadal likes to have one string RPM blast all the way through his racket Roger Federer likes to have a hybrid of gut natural gut in the mains with Ali Power polyester in the crosses Ali Power rough more specifically and it's a personal preference and and that's that's developed over time because Roger Federer when he when he famously beat Pete Sampras at Wimbledon he was using full gut you know full but the game has evolved quite a lot since, even since then that polyester polyester is probably the single most the biggest effect on racket equipment um in the last 20 years uh polyester strings um I may have said this on one of the other videos. Apologies if I have, but Andre Agassi said once when he tried out Luxel on Alipay when he looked to switch it, he said basically they need to let everybody have this or make it illegal because he could just take the massive cuts at the ball that he does and the, the string would just impart that little bit of extra spin, which meant they would drop in, the ball would drop in. And what about thicker and thinner strings? Because you can also get quite a variation so if you for example yeah. is it if you're playing with lots of spin or lots of control or how do you decide between a thicker and a thinner spin i know well, another, well a thicker a thicker option. string a thicker gauge will typically be more for durability um so if you again use the rafa example babala rpm blast that comes in four different gauges it comes in 120 millimeter 125 130 and 135 um they're all a scent, in essence, the same string, but they all play very differently. Um, the thicker the gauge, the, the the more durable the string is. So Rafa plays the 135 gauge because the amount of spin he hits the ball with anything thinner, he snaps within a set. Um, so he needs that extra durability. Um, most most players though prefer the thinner the the one two five gauge because it's kind of the best of both worlds. It's more play up the, the the thinner the gauge, the more feel, the more uh, control you have, the more feel on the ball that you have with that string. Um, and most players prefer to have that rather than the durability. <clears throat> okay. Uh, any other questions, anybody? I've got plenty of questions, but... Yeah, Simon, I've, I've yes, got a Claire. question for Hugh. Uh, Hugh, regarding qualifications, we've got a young coach at our club who may be interested in doing stringing. What yeah. route would you suggest to go down? Um, well, firstly, to get qualified. Um, I'm actually a tutor um, as, as well for, for the Global Racket Stringers Association. Um, there, there, there are others... Um, but that's sort of more that that's one of them that and the European Racket Strings Association, one of the more recognized around the world. Um, there are lots of the, the various stages, like anything at qualifications, there's various stages. There's your entry level of uh, a certified stringer, which means you can string to a standard, you pass an exam, which is written and practical, and then you can go up various different levels all the way to uh, Pro Tour level um and and which is what you need then if you're looking to work at tournaments and that there's different the qualifications are as you'd expect harder as you as you go through the um uh, through the levels um if someone's thinking I, I would first advise them to have a attend a workshop uh and have some tuition spend a couple of days learning the good habits learning the best practice how to do it then go away take those tips that training they've had practice stringing as many rackets as they can get their hands on with ju even just like cheap synthetic gut so great example i have coaches who, who come to me they then go back and then they'll practice using all the rackets out of the shed that they give to you know the, the beginners uh, or cardio tennis or whatever and they'll just freshen up the restrings just to get the practice if you're just putting a cheap synthetic gut in just to practice and then when they're comfortable when they're confident then they could come and get ready to do an exam but if they want to what i would always recommend it's one thing if you just want to string your own rackets but if you're looking to let's be honest make some make some cash make some money you know whatever for whatever reason out of it then you should look to get a qualification so that people can trust your work and that you know what you're doing and can that information be found on your website Hugh? 
Uh, I have a link to the GRSA on my website. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But if not, you've got my. If if you if he wants yeah, to have a chat, tell him to get in touch with me and take him through. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay, I, I have a question on tennis balls for a moment. So the majority of people at clubs and clubs when they're buying tennis balls, probably particularly the tennis clubs when they're purchasing the balls, they would look for a ball which wouldn't fly too much, but but not necess but a ball which is going to last more than, say, one set at a time. People, mm -hmm. would, you know, the majority of players would love the idea of being able to take the same balls out two or three times for a game, as opposed to having to use new balls every time. I know hmm. tennis ball isn't that expensive, but it's another cost, if you like. Yeah. What advice can you give to people not to necessarily choose a particular brand or anything, but what should they be looking for? Because I, I believe most balls come out of, is it two or three factories, or it might even be only two? Uh, I think it's two or three. Um, my advice, if my first, my first port of advice, uh, part of advice there would be, Ideally, you should look to play with fresh balls as frequently as possible to help prevent injury. Because if you combine dead balls with, like we've already been talking about, dead strings, typically damp British days, um, you're asking for trouble with elbow injuries and so on and so forth. Um, appreciate fully, though, that it's an additional expense to use new balls every single time you play. So I get that. What I would look, what I would look for, recommend is ball with sort of thicker felt. If you want to use them for more than one Saturday session, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming this isn't for matches. That matches you'd have fresh balls, yeah, each time. But for for those Saturday socials or whatever, or, or regular hits, get a ball. If you wanted to last couple, get a ball that's got a bit more of a premium felt. If you get a cheaper ball, it won't last. It won't last as long. as It's not meant to. It's made with a cheaper form of felt. If you get a ball uh, that's a little bit more premium, so some examples of that. Um, um, some examples of that would be like a head tour ball, Dunlop ATP, um, uh, Dunlop Australian Open, um, uh, Wilson US Open, a little bit, bit more flighty that you, you've suggested there. Um, those are good babalat team that that's that's a good durable ball but is sometimes seen as heavy um particularly by the the lady play at my club that the, the female teams didn't really like the babalat team they found them too heavy for example but the men preferred them because they lasted a bit longer um slazengers are also okay they're they're good if you're playing on grass or artificial grass but anything it, the other thing you've got to factor in as well is the surface that you're playing on regularly so if you're playing on artificial grass, you could probably, you know, you get a bit more life out of the balls. If you're playing on acrylic, they can sort of particularly rip the felt off the balls. Clay can also rip the felt off the balls. They don't last quite as long. They fluff up. Um, so if you want a bit more longevity, the old phrase is, is true, you know, that you, you get get what you pay for. If you, if you buy a cheaper ball, it's probably not going to last as long. If you buy a, a more premium ball, it will last a little bit longer. And is there such a thing as a ball which works? You talked about damp weather. Is there a ball which <laughs> plays better in damp weather conditions, which is going to cause less, for example, cause issues for your uh, health? Um, unfortunately, no. Tennis is not really a game designed to be played in the damp weather. Um uh, this is what I always, you know, I've had that question put to me as well with, with regards to strings, what's better for playing in the wet? And my my usual answer to that is don't don't play in the wet. Um, it, and, and it's the same with the balls. You know, they're not golf balls, unfortunately. So golf balls are fairly resilient to all weathers. Tennis balls aren't. They're made of fluff. They're, they're made of fluff. They're made of uh, felt um, and they'll absorb the water. So... Unfortunately, that's the thing. We all do it. We all play in 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 damp, miserable conditions because we love the game. But that's the thing. Unfortunately, the balls, there isn't a good ball for that, really. Okay. And my final balls question is: brands 
or manufacturers and brands like potentially Tennis Point and others mm. around have now come out with their own range of tennis balls to quite an extent, which yeah. could be when, for example, people go on to do their search engines, and they have a look around, they could be coming out today better price or more economic price, but there'd be right. a range as well. There could be a basic ball and a better ball. Yeah. And you didn't talk about those kind of that, the generic brands, but... Well, we with tennis points about there, that is that is that something which a sent a half decent player should be looking at or should they be sticking with the brands um no um i i, I didn't want to mention i didn't want to sort of shout too much about it but yeah the, the tennis point we have our own uh, range of ball we have uh the classic and the premium ball uh the premium uh i actually use and i'm not just saying this i actually use in hitting sessions with me largely for testing purposes as well um and it's very good um it's not as strong as a head tour ball head tour is probably still the uh the benchmark for most tennis balls at the moment um but it's not far off but also it is cheaper than a head tour ball so um it, it's probably i position it probably similar to sort of a dunlop ao dunlop ao ball it plays very similar to that it's quite durable. It lasts. It's lasted me a couple of hitting sessions um, on acrylic. You know, th th it's a decent. It's a decent ball, and it's and it's competitively priced. It's worth definitely worth looking at. Okay, thank you. Anybody else got any further questions? Covering Simon, we've got a question here. on the chat um, from Stephen. Uh, I'll, I'll read out Stephen what you've said. Um, would you ever string while we wait? Question mark. And do you sell rackets? Question mark. Any racket you would recommend for a 74 year old low standard club player? Question mark. I've become used to an oversized racket. Okay. Anyone have any questions for you? Uh, let me, uh, yes. So, um, so the first question, do I string while I'm like, yes, I, I can offer that. I would normally charge an extra five pounds for that. Um, it just dep it depends on my workload, what I'm doing. But yes, I have, I do and have done that. Um, I sell rackets via tennis point. <laughs> um, so, um, it's, yeah, so yeah, by all means, have a look on the website there. Um, and we've got quite a range. Um, if you've become used to oversized rackets, the, the, the trend is moving up because the thing is average size rackets are getting bigger. So gone are the days of a racket with a 90 square inch head that Federer used to use. Most of the tour pros now are using around about 9,800 square inch head rackets. Um, an oversized racket used to be only classed as 120, 110 back in the days. The maximum they can be, I believe, is 135 square inch, um, and and also doubles as a snowshoe in that in that instance. Um, but the, I I would recommend you you might be surprised even if you've become used to an oversized racket, you might find something that's a hundred square inch or 104 square inch the racket technologies these days you might find you surprise yourself if you just go for a slightly what you would ordinarily think a more mainstream racket you might find actually is you get on perfectly fine with you know for example a babble app pure drive the blue the blue one is a, that's 100 square inch it's 300 grams it's also available in lighter variations wilson do uh, a blade in 104 square inch um, heads rackets can be you know that their, their gravities come in 102 square inch but aren't generally classed as oversized these days so it probably just broaden your horizons a little bit and, and look at look at the different options but if you have a look at the uh, you know the the information on the tennis point website or other you know what you know do the research on the internet uh, or by all means drop me a message and i'm happy to, to discuss the different merits of different rackets with you um, but just have a look at it. But just don't just necessarily look for oversize. Look at the, the different options. Okay. That all the, all Thanks the very much, Hugh. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Any, uh, so on grips, Hugh, uh, mm -hmm. 
Would you always keep the original grip on for a certain period of time, just use over grips on top of that? Or would you go down to the bare wood uh, of the uh, kit on a regular basis? What would you generally do? Um, it's personal preference. So I happen to use, I use a leather grip with an over grip on top. Um, so I, I remove the base grip, which is normally, I don't like a spongy base grip. Uh, and I replace that with a leather grip and then I soften it slightly by putting an overgrip on top. And that's my personal preference. Um, everybody has their own personal preference. Some players just like to have the grip that comes with the racket. Other players like to have that racket and then they'll whack an overgrip on top of it. And there's all sorts of different reasons why. Some like the, the extra thickness of the grip. Others like the... Um, like to it mean if they put an overgrip on the base grip it makes the base grip last longer in terms of dirt um but what you've got to remember what people forget is like i said earlier that base grip is still going to compress even if you've got an overgrip on top so you know you've just got to bear those things in mind but it, it's a pure pure personal preference thing what i would what i would add though is if you add an overgrip on top of the existing grip it will make hopefully not too obviously, the grip about half a grip size bigger. So if you're a four and a half grip size, it takes it a little bit higher than that. So it depends how some people like that, some people don't. So so would be would the preference be to buy maybe a four and three eighths grip from a shop yeah. to give you more options to then vary it by putting either one, two, or potentially even three grips on top? Uh I would only ever put one grip on top because the danger if you put more than that you're rounding out the bevels of the handle and you end up with just basically like a baseball bat that comes round um so i would never i would never recommend there are ways of doing it so Djokovic has a, le a leather grip then he has one over grip wrapped very specifically so there's no overlap all right and then you put an over grip uh, an over grip on top of that then wrapped as you you normally would and that that's how he but that's purely a personal preference thing. And that's how he likes the feel of his racket. Um, and that also does it in a way then that doesn't round out the bevels on his handle. But it well, I see I do see this a lot where people they, instead of taking the grip off, they'll just add another one <laughs> on. And sometimes they'll just put two replacement grips on and they've got this massive yeah. thing at the bottom of the bottom of the handle, you know. So um, but yeah never ideally good practice never more than one over grip on top of a grip okay so there's an art to grips as much as an art to everything else <laughs> yes yeah there's yeah there, there, there let's go back to the education point and the qualifications part of the exams would be um assessing putting an over grip and a grip on a racket correctly right okay any further questions uh gentlemen today Oh, Andrew's got a question. Sorry, I missed your hand for a second. Andrew, please come in. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, last one, I think, on stringing. When you do hybrids, mm -hmm. where do you go for the feel? Do you put the feel in the main or the cross? Right, I feel, you always feel the string that's in the mains. Okay, cool. Even that's a, whether that's a 16 by 19 or 18 uh, yeah, by 19. Yeah, correct, yeah. yeah. It's, it's always the string in the mains that provides the feel. So if you take Federer, for example, he likes the natural gut in the in the mains because he likes the way that feels, the power, the feel he gets for it. And then he uses the polyester in the crosses to temper the, the power from that, from the gut and add the extra spin. Top. No problem. Right. Uh, any further questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, Hugh, for all the different uh, questions you answered. Huge no problem knowledge, and I've certainly learnt more again. Every time I speak with you, I learn a little bit more. Thank you very much to everybody for joining us. And we've got more events coming up, so please have a look at our website and to see what's coming up. And also have a look at our YouTube videos, a whole series. We have a series of videos which we've done with Hugh, one on strings, one on rackets and one on shoes. So please take a look at that. And uh, Douglas, if you want to non-video, that would be great. And thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you.
Thanks Thank for having me, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. No problem. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.